So what we see is that quantum technology is a race, but it's one that we don't want to become an arms race. It's one that we very much want to be a cooperative one. And it's an unparalleled opportunity for a symbiotic international interdependence that will be very, very difficult to break. So long as, for example, particularly amongst the major international players, so long as they retain relative parity, then there's no huge asymm asymmetry. And, and, and the notion that if I undermine you, I'll undermine yourself remains valid. It's similar to sort of the mutually assured destruction concept. concept. <laughs> But if the, and a huge asymmetry is allowed to emerge and some states end up becoming client states as opposed to relatively equal providers, that's when they're going to be enormously vulnerable to a type of dif diplomatic leverage that never existed in the, in the past. We specifically don't want that to happen, and so we have a responsibility to try and make it that way. How do we do that? Using things like interoperable open standards, making sure that things are modularized and that, that in such a way that just like on the internet, things interoperate and it doesn't just fracture into completely different national networks of any sort. But far more importantly, none of us can afford to abandon the principles that lead to that kind of openness and that kind of advancement, which is what led to the development of the internet in the first place. So how do we become a scientific superpower in that sort of sense? Well, the first thing is you need stability and reliability in, in investments, just like in any investment climate, as a business operator will tell you, you can only retain scientific, you can only retire, retain uh, economic capital, monetary capital, if there's predictable volatility in the markets. Science is the same. A major scientific superpower like this is at risk of losing scientists if there is no predict predictability in the scientific funding, and if it's volatile, and the political circumstances make it uncertain. And so it's important that that doesn't get rejected. Major countries like this have the intellectual capital, have the labor force, have the infrastructure. My country, Australia, will inevitably be a client state. We don't have that kind of capacity. India certainly does have that capacity. The question is whether it has the political leadership to make it and to direct it in that sort of direction. Certainly the United States is already beginning to lose its scientific leadership status for, for the reasons of, that I've discussed on this slide, the rejection of rationalism and the embracement of what is not, in their case, ultranationalism. We don't want other major world powers to go down the same route. Uh, and in the Indian context, certainly much of this can be ex 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 addressed in, in, in a far more eloquently expressed way than I can and that is by this very fine document here. This very much captures all that's necessary for India to be guided in exactly the direction that is necessary to be a part of what I described, rather than outlier and becoming a client state as opposed to a contributor. But as like any constitution like this, it's merely a piece of paper, it doesn't enforce itself, it's the same as applies in the United States. Instead, it's there as a basis to provide, to provide leaders to account, and so it's up to the people to do so, but right across the globe, certainly in the democratic world, we're failing to do so. We say at the beginning of all of these constitutions, we the people, but we fail to uphold it. It's certainly a ubiquitous phenomenon, and certainly in the United States, the constitution has been completely trashed in favor of ultranationalism and polarization, and for that reason, they're losing their scientific status. We have to remember that governments can come and go, but scientific capital, intellectual capital, once it's gone, it's very hard to bring back. And in a constitution, even more so. Once that's gone, it never comes back. Why do I raise these sorts of things in an academic talk? It might seem a bit contentious. The reason is that all of these polarizations and rejections of rationalism that we're seeing across the globe, particularly amongst the major world powers, uh, are things that are very much well recognized by the leaders, and that is that the greatest threat to an anti-rationalist campaign is rationalists. That's people like us. And the greatest threat to those who rewrite history is those who understand it. And that's exactly why there are efforts to try and silence us, and why that must be opposed at all costs. Certainly this happened only one generation ago. It happened in my parents' generation. There's this very famous poem written after the wake of the Holocaust. And you look at it, and it makes perfect sense. And it's repeated in Holocaust museums all around the world. 
the question is that it, we can very clearly see the warning signs happening all around the world all over again, and yet everybody is failing to take action. But it's precisely that phenomena that's going to prevent any of the things that I've discussed in the first scientific part of this talk from actually taking place, and it has to be overcome. That poem was written in relation to the cowardice of German intellectuals. Well, we're all intellectuals here, so let us not be the cowards. Richard Feynman very famously said, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics. I would rather say to most people of the free world, if you think you understand history, you don't understand history. And for that reason, people should study history, because otherwise, all of the things I've said in the first half of the talk are not science, but science fiction. Thank you.